We found that partner in Deloitte. They brought the expertise of their global teams, experiences from the region, and successes in the Philippines to this engagement. Our collaboration with Deloitte targeted outcomes aligned to the ultimate vision of setting up a new school of information communications technology. This including raising the employability of our graduates by offering a curriculum befitting the digital era. Improving student learning outcomes through the introduction of innovative pedagogical methods. Deploying a highly qualified and credentialed faculty. Setting up a world-class university infrastructure to support the academic learning as well as operations. And accelerate all of this through partnering with the best universities and corporates. Together, we have now chartered a five-year roadmap to realize this vision. Deloitte provided extensive research and actionable intelligence on what to teach, how to teach, and the qualifications of our faculty needed to deliver a world-class education. They introduced partnerships with qualified academic institutions to provide advice on key areas such as curriculum design and pedagogical methods. They supported us in expanding our network with corporates focused on upskilling faculty with technology to boost our staff qualifications. The approach to this transformation has us as agents of change as we transform the San Beda community. We look forward to welcoming the digital natives of today and tomorrow and continuing down the path we have chartered together. Beda University was established in 1901 and since then has continually provided its students with a platform to be globally competitive. Our vision is to be the top digital university in the Philippines with the opening of a new college for information, communication, and technology. The ultimate vision of this college is to shape our graduates to be the leaders of a better tomorrow through the best curriculum, faculty, and research supported by an application of technology that furthers social good. We needed to create a college that works for our students and prepares them in the best possible manner for a dynamic future. We found that partner in Deloitte. They brought the expertise of their global teams, experiences from the region, and successes in the Philippines to this engagement. Our collaboration with Deloitte targeted outcomes aligned to the ultimate vision of setting up a new school of information communications technology. This including raising the employability of our graduates by offering a curriculum befitting the digital era improving student learning outcomes through the introduction of innovative pedagogical methods, deploying a highly qualified and credentialed faculty, setting up a world-class university infrastructure to support the academic learning as well as operations, and accelerate all of this through partnering with the best universities and corporates. Together, we have now chartered a five-year roadmap to realize this vision. Deloitte provided extensive research and actionable intelligence on what to teach, how to teach, and the qualifications of our faculty needed to deliver a world-class education. They introduced partnerships with qualified academic institutions to provide advice on key areas such as curriculum design and pedagogical methods. They supported us in expanding our network with corporates focused on upskilling faculty with technology to boost our staff qualifications. The approach to this transformation has us as agents of change as we transform the San Beda community. We look forward to welcoming the digital natives of today and tomorrow and continuing down the path we have chartered together. San 
Beda University was established in 1901 and since then has continually provided its students with a platform to be globally competitive. Our vision is to be the top digital university in the Philippines with the opening of a new college for information, communication, and technology. The ultimate vision of this college is to shape our graduates to be the leaders of a better tomorrow through the best curriculum, faculty, and research supported by an application of technology that furthers social good. We needed to create a college that works for our students and prepares them in the best possible manner for a dynamic future. We found that partner in Deloitte. They brought the expertise of their global teams, experiences from the region, and successes in the Philippines to this engagement. Our collaboration with Deloitte targeted outcomes aligned to the ultimate vision of setting up a new school of information communications technology. This including raising the employability of our graduates by offering a curriculum befitting the digital era. Improving student learning outcomes through the introduction of innovative pedagogical methods. Deploying a highly qualified and credentialed faculty. Setting up a world-class university infrastructure to support the academic learning as well as operations. And accelerate all of this through partnering with the best universities and corporates. Together, we have now chartered a five-year roadmap to realize this vision. Deloitte provided extensive research and actionable intelligence on what to teach, how to teach, and the qualifications of our faculty needed to deliver a world-class education. They introduced partnerships with qualified academic institutions to provide advice on key areas such as curriculum design and pedagogical methods. They supported us in expanding our network with corporates focused on upskilling faculty with technology to boost our staff qualifications. The approach to this transformation has us as agents of change as we transform the San Beda community. We look forward to welcoming the digital natives of today and tomorrow and continuing down the path we have chartered together. Beda University was established in 1901 and since then has continually provided its students with a platform to be globally competitive. Our vision is to be the top digital university in the Philippines with the opening of a new college for information, communication, and technology. The ultimate vision of this college is to shape our graduates to be the leaders of a better tomorrow through the best curriculum, faculty, and research supported by an application of technology that furthers social good. We needed to create a college that works for our students and prepares them in the best possible manner for a dynamic future. We found that partner in Deloitte they brought the expertise of their global teams, experiences from the region, and successes in the Philippines to this engagement. Our collaboration with Deloitte targeted
Cepeda University was established in 1901 and since then has continually provided its students with a platform to be globally competitive. Our vision is to be the top digital university in the Philippines with the opening of a new college for information, communication, and technology. The ultimate vision of this college is to shape our graduates to be the leaders of a better tomorrow through the best curriculum, faculty, and research supported by an application of technology that furthers social good. We needed to create a college that works for our students and prepares them in the best possible manner for a dynamic future. We found that partner in Deloitte. They brought the expertise of their global teams, experiences from the region, and successes in the Philippines to this engagement. Our collaboration with Deloitte targeted outcomes aligned to the ultimate vision of setting up a new school of information communications technology. This including raising the employability of our graduates by offering a curriculum befitting the digital era. Improving student learning outcomes through the introduction of innovative pedagogical methods. Deploying a highly qualified and credentialed faculty. Setting up a world-class university infrastructure to support the academic learning as well as operations. And accelerate all of this through partnering with the best universities and corporates. Together, we have now chartered a five-year roadmap to realize this vision. Deloitte provided extensive research and actionable intelligence on what to teach, how to teach, and the qualifications of our faculty needed to deliver a world-class education. They introduced partnerships with qualified academic institutions to provide advice on key areas such as curriculum design and pedagogical methods. They supported us in expanding our network with corporates focused on upskilling faculty with technology to boost our staff qualifications. The approach to this transformation has us as agents of change as we transform the San Beda community. We look forward to welcoming the digital natives of today and tomorrow and continuing down the path we have chartered together. Beda University was established in 1901 and since then has continually provided its students with a platform to be globally competitive. Our vision is to be the top digital university in the Philippines with the opening of a new college for information, communication, and technology. The ultimate vision of this college is to shape our graduates to be the leaders of a better tomorrow through the best curriculum, faculty, and research supported by an application of technology that furthers social good. We needed to create a college that works for our students and prepares them in the best possible manner for a dynamic future. We found that partner in Deloitte. They brought the expertise of their global teams, experiences from the region, and successes in the Philippines to this engagement. Our collaboration with Deloitte targeted outcomes aligned to the ultimate vision of setting up a new school of information communications technology. This including raising the employability of our graduates by offering a curriculum befitting the digital era improving student learning outcomes through the introduction of innovative pedagogical methods, deploying a highly qualified and credentialed faculty, setting up a world-class university infrastructure to support the academic learning as well as operations, and accelerate all of this through partnering with the best universities and corporates. Together, we have now chartered a five-year roadmap to realize this vision. 
Deloitte provided extensive research and actionable intelligence on what to teach, how to teach, and the qualifications of our faculty needed to deliver a world-class education. They introduced partnerships with qualified academic institutions to provide advice on key areas such as curriculum design and pedagogical methods. They supported us in expanding our network with corporates focused on upskilling faculty with technology to boost our staff qualifications. The approach to this transformation has us as agents of change as we transform the San Beda community. We look forward to welcoming the digital natives of today and tomorrow and continuing down the path we have chartered together. Sanbeda University was established in 1901 and since then has continually provided its students with a platform to be globally competitive. Our vision is to be the top digital university in the Philippines with the opening of a new college for information, communication, and technology. The ultimate vision of this college is to shape our graduates to be the leaders of a better tomorrow through the best curriculum, faculty, and research supported by an application of technology that furthers social good. We needed to create a college that works for our students and prepares them in the best possible manner for a dynamic future. We found that partner in Deloitte. They brought the expertise of their global teams, experiences from the region, and successes in the Philippines to this engagement. Our collaboration with Deloitte targeted outcomes aligned to the ultimate vision of setting up a new school of information communications technology. This including raising the employability of our graduates by offering a curriculum befitting the digital era. Improving student learning outcomes through the introduction of innovative pedagogical methods. Deploying a highly qualified and credentialed faculty. Setting up a world-class university infrastructure to support the academic learning as well as operations. And accelerate all of this through partnering with the best universities and corporates. Together, we have now chartered a five-year roadmap to realize this vision. Deloitte provided extensive research and actionable intelligence on what to teach, how to teach, and the qualifications of our faculty needed to deliver a world-class education. They introduced partnerships with qualified academic institutions to provide advice on key areas such as curriculum design and pedagogical methods. They supported us in expanding our network with corporates focused on upskilling faculty with technology to boost our staff qualifications. The approach to this transformation has us as agents of change as we transform the San Beda community. We look forward to welcoming the digital natives of today and tomorrow and continuing down the path we have chartered together. Sanbeda University was established in 1901 and since then has continually provided its students with a platform to be globally competitive. Our vision is to be the top digital university in the Philippines with the opening of a new college for information, communication, and technology. The ultimate vision of this college is to shape our graduates to be the leaders of a better tomorrow through the best curriculum, faculty, and research supported by an application of technology that furthers social good. 
We needed to create a college that works for our students and prepares them in the best possible manner for a dynamic future. We found that partner in Deloitte. They brought the expertise of their global teams, experiences from the region, and successes in the Philippines to this engagement. Our collaboration with Deloitte targeted outcomes aligned to the ultimate vision of setting up a new school of information communications technology. This including raising the employability of our graduates by offering a curriculum befitting the digital era. Improving student learning outcomes through the introduction of innovative pedagogical methods. Deploying a highly qualified and credentialed faculty. Setting up a world-class university infrastructure to support the academic learning as well as operations. And accelerate all of this through partnering with the best universities and corporates. Together, we have now chartered a five-year roadmap to realize this vision. Deloitte provided extensive research and actionable intelligence on what to teach, how to teach, and the qualifications of our faculty needed to deliver a world-class education. They introduced partnerships with qualified academic institutions to provide advice on key areas such as curriculum design and pedagogical methods. They supported us in expanding our network with corporates focused on upskilling faculty with technology to boost our staff qualifications. The approach to this transformation has us as agents of change as we transform the San Beda community. We look forward to welcoming the digital natives of today and tomorrow and continuing down the path we have chartered together. Beda University was established in 1901 and since then has continually provided its students with a platform to be globally competitive. Our vision is to be the top digital university in the Philippines with the opening of a new college for information, communication, and technology. The ultimate vision of this college is to shape our graduates to be the leaders of a better tomorrow through the best curriculum, faculty, and research supported by an application of technology that furthers social good. We needed to create a college that works for our students and prepares them in the best possible manner for a dynamic future. We found that partner in Deloitte. They brought the expertise of their global teams, experiences from the region, and successes in the Philippines to this engagement. Our collaboration with Deloitte targeted outcomes aligned to the ultimate vision of setting up a new school of information communications technology. This including raising the employability of our graduates by offering a curriculum befitting the digital era. Improving student learning outcomes through the introduction of innovative pedagogical methods. Deploying a highly qualified and credentialed faculty. Setting up a world-class university infrastructure to support the academic learning as well as operations. And accelerate all of this through partnering with the best universities and corporates. Together, we have now chartered a five-year roadmap to realize this vision. Deloitte provided extensive research and actionable intelligence on what to teach, how to teach, and the qualifications of our faculty needed to deliver a world-class education. They introduced partnerships with qualified academic institutions to provide advice on key areas such as curriculum design and pedagogical methods. They supported us in expanding our network with corporates focused on upskilling faculty with technology to boost our staff qualifications. The approach to this transformation has us as agents of change as we transform the San Beda community. We look forward to welcoming the digital natives of today and tomorrow 
and continuing down the path we have chartered together. Beda University was established in 1901 and since then has continually provided its students with a platform to be globally competitive. Our vision is to be the top digital university in the Philippines with the opening of a new college for information, communication, and technology. The ultimate vision of this college is to shape our graduates to be the leaders of a better tomorrow through the best curriculum, faculty, and research supported by an application of technology that furthers social good. We needed to create a college that works for our students and prepares them in the best possible manner for a dynamic future. We found that partner in Deloitte. They brought the expertise of their global teams, experiences from the region, and successes in the Philippines to this engagement. Our collaboration with Deloitte targeted outcomes aligned to the ultimate vision of setting up a new school of information communications technology. This including raising the employability of our graduates by offering a curriculum in the digital era. Outcomes through the introduction of innovative pedagogical methods, deploying a highly qualified and credentialed faculty, setting up a world class university infrastructure to support the academic learning as well as operations, and accelerate all of this through partnering with the best universities and corporates. Together, we have now chartered a five year roadmap to realize this vision. Deloitte provided extensive research and actionable intelligence on what to teach, how to teach, and the qualifications of our faculty needed to deliver a world-class education. They introduced partnerships with qualified academic institutions to provide advice on key areas such as curriculum design. They supported us in expanding our network with corporates, focused on upskilling faculty with technology, to boost our staff qualifications. The approach to this transformation has us as agents of change as we transform the San Beda community. We look forward to welcoming the digital natives of today and tomorrow and continuing down the path we have chartered together. Beda University was established in 1901 and since then has continually provided its students with a platform to be globally competitive. Our vision is to be the top digital university in the Philippines with the opening of a new college for information, communication, and technology. The ultimate vision of this college is to shape our graduates to be the leaders of a better tomorrow through the best curriculum, faculty, and research supported by an application of technology that furthers social good. We needed to create a college that works for our students and prepares them in the best possible manner for a dynamic future. We found that partner in Deloitte. They brought the expertise of their global teams, experiences from the region, and successes in the Philippines to this engagement. Our collaboration with Deloitte targeted outcomes aligned to the ultimate vision of setting up a new school of information communications technology. This including raising the employability of our graduates by offering a curriculum befitting the digital era improving student learning outcomes through the introduction of innovative pedagogical methods, 
deploying a highly qualified and credentialed faculty, setting up a world-class university infrastructure to support the academic learning as well as operations, and accelerate all of this through partnering with the best universities and corporates. Together, we have now chartered a five-year roadmap to realize this vision. Deloitte provided extensive research and actionable intelligence on what to teach, how to teach, and the qualifications of our faculty needed to deliver a world-class education. They introduced partnerships with qualified academic institutions to provide advice on key areas such as curriculum design and pedagogical methods. They supported us in expanding our network with corporates, focused on upskilling faculty with technology to boost our staff qualifications. The approach to this transformation has us as agents of change as we transform the San Beda community. We look forward to welcoming the digital natives of today and tomorrow and continuing down the path we have chartered together. Beda University was established in 1901 and since then has continually provided its students with a platform to be globally competitive. Our vision is to be the top digital university in the Philippines with the opening of a new college for information, communication, and technology. The ultimate vision of this college is to shape our graduates to be the leaders of a better tomorrow through the best curriculum, faculty, and research supported by an application of technology that furthers social good. We needed to create a college that works for our students and prepares them in the best possible manner for a dynamic future. We found that partner in Deloitte they brought the expertise of their global teams, experiences from the region, and successes in the Philippines to this engagement. Our collaboration with Deloitte targeted outcomes aligned to the ultimate vision of setting up a new school of information communications technology. This including raising the employability of our graduates by offering a curriculum befitting the digital era improving student learning outcomes through the introduction of innovative pedagogical methods, deploying a highly qualified and credentialed faculty, setting up a world-class university infrastructure to support the academic learning as well as operations, and accelerate all of this through partnering with the best universities and corporates. Together, we have now chartered a five-year roadmap to realize this vision. Deloitte provided extensive research and actionable intelligence on what to teach, how to teach, and the qualifications of our faculty needed to deliver a world-class education. They introduced partnerships with qualified academic institutions to provide advice on key areas such as curriculum design and pedagogical methods. They supported us in expanding our network with corporates, focused on upskilling faculty with technology, to boost our staff qualifications. The approach to this transformation has us as agents of change as we transform the San Beda community. We look forward to welcoming the digital natives of today and tomorrow and continuing down the path we have chartered together. Beda University was established in 1901 and since then has continually provided its students with a platform to be globally competitive. Our vision is to be the top digital university in the Philippines with the opening of a new college for information, 
communication, and technology. The ultimate vision of this college is to shape our graduates to be the leaders of a better tomorrow through the best curriculum, faculty, and research supported by an application of technology that furthers social good. We needed to create a college that works for our students and prepares them in the best possible manner for a dynamic future. We found that partner in Deloitte. They brought the expertise of their global teams, experiences from the region, and successes in the Philippines to this engagement. Our collaboration with Deloitte targeted outcomes aligned to the ultimate vision of setting up a new school of information communications technology. This including raising the employability of our graduates by offering a curriculum befitting the digital era. Improving student learning outcomes through the introduction of innovative pedagogical methods. Deploying a highly qualified and credentialed faculty. Setting up a world-class university infrastructure to support the academic learning as well as operations. And accelerate all of this through partnering with the best universities and corporates. Together, we have now chartered a five-year roadmap to realize this vision. Deloitte provided extensive research and actionable intelligence on what to teach, how to teach, and the qualifications of our faculty needed to deliver a world-class education. They introduced partnerships with qualified academic institutions to provide advice on key areas such as curriculum design and pedagogical methods. They supported us in expanding our network with corporates, focused on upskilling faculty with technology to boost our staff qualifications. The approach to this transformation has us as agents of change as we transform the San Beda community. We look forward to welcoming the digital natives of today and tomorrow and continuing down the path we have chartered together. Beda University was established in 1901 and since then has continually provided its students with a platform to be globally competitive. Our vision is to be the top digital university in the Philippines with the opening of a new college for information, communication, and technology. The ultimate vision of this college is to shape our graduates to be the leaders of a better tomorrow through the best curriculum, faculty, and research supported by an application of technology that furthers social good. We needed to create a college that works for our students and prepares them in the best possible manner for a dynamic future. We found that partner in Deloitte. They brought the expertise of their global teams, experiences from the region, and successes in the Philippines to this engagement. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Eir Albon from the San Pedro University College of Law. Setting up a new school of information. And along with Ms. Andrea Manuel, we will be your host for today. Hello. Hello everyone and good afternoon. Welcome to the first ever Law Colloquium, the Dean Emeritus Virgilio B. Hara Lecture Series. Again, good afternoon everyone. I am Aira Albon from the San Pedro University College of Law. And I am Andrea Elise Manuel, also from the San Pedro University College of Law. Welcome to the first Ms. ever Law Colloquium. Ms. Manuel, I think you're muted. Welcome to the first ever Law Colloquium, the Dean Emeritus Virgilio B. Hara Lecture Series. And we will be your host for today's event. Before we formally start our program, let us, first, let us first ask for the blessing of our Almighty Father. Just a 
check, Ms. Ayer Albon. Can you hear me now? Yes, you're okay. You're okay. Yes, we can hear you, Ms. Manuel. All right. Let us put ourselves in the holy presence of our Lord. Uh, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, our ultimate truth and supreme law, we humbly offer our day to you. May every word we say today speak the truth, and every action we take is the law. Make us able counsel to our clients, worthy officers of the court, and loyal servants of your justice. Measure our day not by our failures or successes, but by our faithfulness to your will. And may each day of doing your will bring us closer to your kingdom of righteousness, justice, and love. We ask this through Christ, Lord, amen, that in all things God may be glorified. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us all rise for the Philippine National Anthem. To officially open this event, let us all welcome the proponent of this lecture series, the father of our institution, the Dean of the College of Law, Dean Marciano G. Delson. Okay. Uh, to my dear bedans and uh, citizens of uh, the Republic, magandang hapon po sa inyong lahat. On behalf of the San Beda University, under the leadership of our Rector President, the Reverend Father Aloysius Maria A. Maranan of the Order of St. Benedict, and the faculty of the Best Law School in Mindiola, we welcome you to the premier presentation of the Law Colloquium, the Dean Emeritus Virgilio B. Hara Lecture Series, an annual event of the College of Law in celebration of University Week. Our well wishes for our boss, uh, Dean Virgilio Bihara. May you have uh, the best of health and uh, we miss you, Dean. Uh, this is a campaign for awareness and not for a particular candidate. Whatever political color you have on your FB profiles must be respected. Ang masasabi ko lang po, pag-ingatan po natin ang ating mga puso. Do not suffer a heart attack just because you do not want the candidate of your neighbor. Try patience, try understanding, and again, a great deal of respect. A colloquium is an academic conference 
that encourages discussion among lecturers and listeners on matters of common interest. To initiate the exchange of ideas on election rules and the role of citizens and voters in this democratic process, we are immensely honored to have our Bedan brothers, Attorney Ed Gialogo, an election law practitioner, former Comelec Commissioner Rene Sarmiento, known as the Cardinal in the Commission for his unblemished integrity and religiosity. And of course, former Comelec Commissioner Antonio Co, who just ended his term of office last week. Uh, welcome back to the faculty, uh, Commissioner uh, Richie. But uh, of course, personally, uh, we are praying that you will be appointed to the Supreme Court for greater national interest. So my dear learners of the law, please feel free to engage our resources speakers in a healthy and productive colloquium. Again, welcome and good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dean, for that inspiring message. And it is noteworthy to note that Dean um, Delson has actually proposed this lecture series and considered this as a child. So thank you so much, Dean, for coming <laughs> up with this timely and wonderful program. Before we, we officially begin our lectures, please be advised that you may send your questions or comments through the Zoom chat box during the program. You may send it to us directly or to everyone. Hence, please reserve your questions for later. This will serve as our open forum at the latter part of the program. Thank you. And to finally begin our session, our first guest graduated from De La Salle University with a Bachelor of Arts degree in Economics and Bachelor of Science in Commerce. He finished his Bachelor of Laws in the San Beda College, now San Beda University, and placed 10th in the 1991 bar examinations. He was the former Undersecretary of Department of Justice and also the former legal consultant in office of Senator Aquilino Pimentel Jr. He recently retired as the Commissioner of Commission of Elections or COMELEC, last February 2, 2022. He is also a law professor at Aureliano Law, San Beda College of Law, and De La Salle College of Law. Let us all welcome Commissioner Antonio Co. Jr. Magandang hapon sa inyong lahat. I'm Antonio Co. Jr., I am a graduate of San Beda College of Law, Batch 1991. I taught at San Beda Law School for about 20 years, but left teaching to join government as Undersecretary of the Department of Justice and as Commissioner of the Commission on Elections. A few days ago, I finished my term as Commissioner and retired from Comelec. After a short hiatus from teaching, I am excited to again okay. face the Bedan Law community and hopefully impart my knowledge and experience from my government service and hope to go back to teaching again. Thank you, Dean Rocky, for inviting me to give a lecture in this Dean Emeritus Virgilio Bihara Public Lecture Series. Uh, I extend my apologies for I cannot join you in real time uh, for this lecture. My lecture today is relevant because in a few months, we will have another celebration of democracy the national and local elections on May 9, 2022. I hope all of you are registered voters and will exercise your sovereign right to vote uh, come this election to elect our next batch of public officials. My lecture will give you a bird's eye view on some rules and guidelines applicable to the May 9, 2022 national and local elections, namely, number one, the rules on gun ban covered under COMELEC Resolution Number 10728. Number two, we have rules on the prohibition against appointment or hiring of new employees, creation or filling up of new positions, the giving 
of salary increases, the transfer or, or detail of civil service employees, and the suspension of elected local officials. Number three, I'll, my lecture will touch on the guidelines for the conduct of in-person campaigns, rallies, caucuses, meetings, and conventions, motorcades and caravans, and meeting the avance under the new normal conditions. Now let us start. Comelec scheduled the filing of the Certificate of Candidacy from October 1, 2021 to October 8, 2021, including Saturday and Sunday. For individual candidates, this refers to the filing of the Certificate of Candidacy for all elective positions and filing of the Certificate of Nomination and Acceptance, known as CONA. For party list groups, coalitions, and organizations, the filing refers to the list of nominees, Certificate of Nomination, and the Certificate of Acceptance of Nomination and Affidavit. Before proceeding, we need to define who is a candidate. A candidate refers to any person seeking an elective public office who has filed a certificate of candidacy. However, any person who has filed a certificate of candidacy shall only be considered as a candidate at the start of the campaign period for which he or she filed his or her certificate of candidacy. On the other hand, nominees of a party list group seeking a seat in the House of Representatives through the party list system of representation shall also be considered as a candidate. If you are an incumbent public officer, what is the effect of the filing of your certificate of candidacy? One, for elected public officials, they continue to hold public office until June 30, 2022. But a different rule applies to appointed public officials. For them, they are considered ipso facto resigned from the date of the filing of their certificate of candidacy. Now, let us go to the remedy of substitution which became controversial lately. Substitution of candidates can be done until the midday of election day. There are three situations for a valid substitution. We have withdrawal, we have death, and we have disqualification of a candidate. For withdrawal, a candidate can withdraw at any time. But for a valid substitution to take place, the withdrawal of the candidate and substitution by any, another person from the same political party must be made on or before November 15, 2021. After said date, a withdrawal can still happen, but there can no longer be substitution. For death and disqualification, if the candidate dies or is disqualified at any time before midday of election day, substitution can take place by another person belonging to the same party but the substitute must have the same surname of the substituted. Take note, for independent candidates, we do not allow substitution. Now let us go to uh, election, the definition of election period. Um, when is the election period? The election period is from January 9, 2022 to June 8, 2022. What are the some effects of the start of the election period, the prohibited acts during the election period? Number one, we have bearing, carrying, and transporting firearms or other deadly weapons unless authorized in writing by Comerec. Number two, use of security personnel or bodyguards by a candidate unless authorized by Comerec. Number three, transfer or movement of officers and employees in the civil service. Number four, suspension of elected local officials. Now, let us go to the first one, the gun ban. The purpose of the gun ban is to uh, minimize violence or, or hopefully eliminate violence during election day. So what are the prohibited acts during the election period? 
Number one, we have that no person shall bear, carry, or transport firearms or deadly weapons outside of his or her residence or place of business and in all places, including any building, street, park, and in private vehicles or public conveyances, even if he or she is licensed or authorized to possess or to carry the same, unless authorized by the Comelec through the Committee on the Ban on Firearms and Security Concerns. Now, this number one prohibition covers firearms or deadly weapons. What are firearms? Firearms are referred to any handheld or portable weapon, whether a small arm or light weapon, that expels or designed to expel a bullet, shot, slug, missile, or any projectile, which is discharged by means of expansive force of gases from burning gunpowder or other form of combustion or any similar instrument or implement, when in the barrel, frame, or receiver is considered a firearm. Take note, firearms included includes air guns, airsoft guns, and replicas imitation of firearms that can cause an ordinary person to believe that they are real, including the parts thereof. These firearms include antique firearms. On the other hand, uh, imitation firearms refer to a replica of a firearm or other device that is so substantially similar in coloration and overall appearance to an existing firearm as to lead a reasonable person to believe that such imitation firearm is a real firearm. Aside from firearms, it also covers deadly weapons. Deadly weapon is defined as those bladed instruments, hand grenades, or other explosive except pyrotechnics, provided that a bladed instrument is not covered by the prohibition when possession of the bladed instrument is necessary to the occupation of the possessor or when it is used as a tool for legitimate activity. Take note, bl souvenir bladed weapons, which are considered as ornamental display items, are not covered by the prohibition on bearing, carrying, and transporting of deadly weapons. So that's the first Prohibition, carrying of firearms and deadly weapons. Number two, no person shall employ, avail himself, herself, the services of security personnel or bodyguards, whether or not such security personnel or bodyguards are regular members or officers of the PNP, AFP, or other private law enforcement agencies of the government or, pri or private security service providers, unless authorized by government. So, Yung mga security guards, yung mga bodyguards ng mga malalaking tao, bawal yan. Unless they secure a permit or license or a certificate of authority from government. Number three, um, no person or entity shall transport and deliver firearms and or its parts, ammunition and or components and explosives and or its components, unless authorized by Covenant. Uh, what is an explosive? An explosive refer to an exploding substance or agent, including the components and raw materials thereof. Okay. Now, please note, yung mga permit to carry firearms outside of residence or the PTC FOR, the letter orders or the mission orders issued by the chief PNP, the chief of staff of the AFP, the commanding general or flag officer in command of the different branches of the AFP, or their duly authorized representatives or any other head or duly authorized official of government law enforcement agency are hereby declared, take note, suspended ineffective and without force and effect during the election period unless they are properly covered by certificate authority issued by the company. Now, what are the different categories of certificate of authorities? We have eight. The first one is the certificate of authority issued to law enforcement agencies. 
these are issued to the Philipp for uh, to the PNP as an institution, the AFP and other government departments, agencies, office offices, bureaus, commissions, and tribunals, specifically limited to and covering only personnel in the active regular plantilla of the said agencies performing law enforcement and security functions and and or election duties and are receiving regular compensation for the said services rendered therein. Please note that this excludes consultants, part-time, temporary, contractual, casual, or job order employees, or confidential agents, employees or personnel, as well as those under contracts of service, whether or not receiving compensation from the government or for services rendered. Number two, uh, certificate of authority issued to diplomatic missions. Uh, this referred to the CA issued to security personnel of foreign diplomatic corps, mission and establishment under international law, including foreign military personnel in the Philippines covered by existing treaties and international agreements endorsed by the Secretary of Foreign Affairs and the heads of missions and foreign countries in the Philippines. Number three, dun sa mga security agencies offering private security, investigative and protective services. We issue certificate, the COMELEC issues certificate of authority to these securities, security agencies. Fourth, COMELEC also issues certificates of authority to cashiers and disbursing officers of privately owned corporations and companies. Fifth, certificate of authorities can be issued also to what is known as the high risk individual. This referred to, number one, qualified official of government of the Republic of the Philippines who by the nature of his her person, position, duty, profession, and of office is performing law enforcement and or security functions and or election duties and is thus considered as a high risk individual. Number two, qualified individual who by the nature of his official duties profession, business, or occupation is under or is under the Witness Protection Security and Benefit Program of the government, of the DOJ, or any similar program of the government, and deemed by the COMELEC, the chief of the PNP, and the AFP as a high-risk individual. This cover former public officials. Six, um, we also issue a Comelec also issues certificate of authority to security detail. This refers to earlier what I said earlier, the security guards and uh, close insecurity of uh, important people. Uh, these are public officials and private individuals. Seven, we also issue Comelec also issues certificate of authority uh, for the transport or delivery of firearms and or its parts, ammunition and its components, and explosive and all its components. And lastly, COMELEC issues certificates of authority to sport shooters. This refers to competitive sport shooters, excluding alien citizens or foreigners, who will be participating in international classifier and qualifier matches scheduled prior to election period in representation of their duly registered organization and or the Philippines. What is the application process here? Uh, COMELEC uh, device a new way. Before before the pandemic, we uh, application is to personal filing with the COMELEC. Now we have uh, an online application. You can access those who are interested to apply. You can still file an online process, an online application in the website of COMELEC. So punta na lang kayo doon at there are steps uh, mentioned there on how to file. Uh, your application for gun ban exception with all the necessary uh, requirements that you need to file together with your application. Now, what is the penalty uh, for gun ban violation? Any person who, number one, bear, carry, transport firearms or other deadly weapons. Number two, employ, avail, or engage in the services of security personnel or bodyguards. And number three, transport or deliver firearms and or its parts, ammunition, and its components, and explosive and, and or its components during the election period 
without a valid and subsisting certificate of authority shall be liable for an election offense. Any person found guilty of any election offense shall be punished with imprisonment of not less than one year, but not more than six years, and shall be not be subject to probation. In addition, the guilty party shall be sentenced to suffer disqualification to hold public office and deprivation of the right of suffrage. If he is a foreigner, he shall be sentenced to deportation, which shall be enforced after the prison term has been served. Now, earlier I mentioned about the election period. We have also what is known as the campaign pe period, so they are different. What is the campaign period? For candidates for president, vice president, senator, and party list groups participating in the party list system of representation, their campaign period is from February 8, 2022 to May 7, 2022. So it started two days ago. For members of the House of Representatives and elective provincial, city, and municipal of officials, their campaign period will start on March 25, 2022 to May 7, 2022. So matagal pa yan. More than one month from today. Please note, however, that it is prohibited to campaign on April 14, 2022, which is Monday, Thursday, and April 15, 2022, which is Good Friday. Now, have you heard about the so-called premature campaigning? It's a person who filed her certificate, his or her certificate of candidacy and engaged in a campaign prior to the campaign period, liable for premature campaigning. The Supreme Court already ruled on this matter. It said that a person who has filed his certificate of candidacy and engaged in campaigning prior to the campaign period is not liable for premature campaigning. So in Peñera versus Comelec and Andanar, the Supreme Court ruled that under Section 15 of Republic Act 8436, as amended by Republic Act 9360, Congress has laid down the law that a candidate is liable for election offenses only upon the start of the campaign period. This, the court ruled that it has no power to ignore the clear and express mandate of the law that any person who files a certificate of candidacy within the period shall only be considered a candidate at the start of the campaign period for which he filed his certificate of candidacy. The, the court said that it cannot turn a blind eye to the express and clear language of the law that any unlawful act or omission applicable to a candidate shall take effect only upon the start of the campaign period. So in tinatawag natin, EPAL campaigning can be considered as an election offense. So, Yung mga napansin ninyo sa mga TV, sa mga rallies, etc., etc., that took place prior to February 8 sa mga national candidates natin, especially for the president. Yung mga campaign nila prior to February 8 are not considered premature campaigning because they are not yet still prior to February 8 considered as a candidate. So nag-start lang yan two days ago, February 8. So the rules on prohibition, on campaigning will start two days ago for these national candidates. Okay, now let us now go to the second resolution I, I referred to, which is resolution, Comelec Resolution Number 10742. These uh, rules cover the prohibition against appointment or hiring of new employees, the creation or filling up of new positions, <coughs> the giving of salary increases, the transfer or detail of civil service employees, the suspension of elective local officials in connection with the May 9, 2022 national and local elections. Ano purpose nitong resolution na to? No? Uh, Comelec, this is to prohibit uh, any manner, any action that would influence the result of the election. This is one of those uh, uh, rules that would eliminate unlawful influence that would benefit or destroy a candidate. Okay. 
So how does this rule apply? During the election period, uh, bawal ang transfer or detail of employees and then bawal din yung tinatawag natin suspension of elected provincial, city, municipal, or barangay officer. So, let us tackle the transfer or detail of employees. So, during the election period, from January 9 to June 8, 2022, no public official shall, except upon prior written approval of COMELEC, make or cause any transfer or detail whatsoever of any officer or employee in the public service, in the civil service including public school officials. The phrase transfer or detail refers to any movement of personnel from one station to another, whether or not in the same office or agency during the election is covered by the prohibition. Transfer incidental to promotion as well incidental to appointment is within the purview of the prohibition against transfer during the election period. Now, what do you mean by transfer? Transfer is a movement from one position to another, which is of equivalent rank, level, or salary without break in service involving the issuance of an appointment. The transfer may be from one department or agency to another, or from one organizational unit to another in the same department or agency. This shall also include movements consequent to an order for return or recall of the detailed assigned or reassigned personnel to the original or previous place of assignment within the period of prohibition. What do you mean by detail, which is also prohibited, is the movement of an employee from one department or agency which is temporary in nature which does not involve a reduction in rank, status, or salary, and does not require the issuance of another appointment. It shall be allowed only for a limited period in case of employees occupational, occupy, occupying professional, technical, and scientific position. Now, uh, so bawal ang detail and transfer of employees. Another prohibition during the election period is the suspension of elective provincial, city, municipal, or barangay officer. So from January 9 again to uh, June 8, 2022, the provision, any provision of the law to the contrary notwithstanding, no public official shall except upon written prior approval of COMELEC suspend any elected provincial, city, municipal, or barangay officer. The ban shall include preventive suspension or suspension imposed as a penalty. However, no prior approval is necessary if the suspension of elected local official refers to offenses which is punishable under the Anti-Graft and Corrupt Practices Act. Number two, for those that were already implemented before the start of the election period but is continuously served during or even after the expiration of the election period. So, the onset of the election period will not have any effect of lifting any suspension imposed as a penalty or preventive suspension that is already being served. Also, the prohibition does not apply to dismissal from the service recall and removal of elected local officials lo uh, removal of elected local officials so those are the prohibition uh, during the election period what are those prohibition naman dun sa during the campaign period so the campaign period referred to here is the campaign period for the members of the house of representatives the elected provincial city and municipal officials from March 25 to May 8, 2022. So number one prohibition, appointment or hiring of new employees and the creation and filling up of new positions. So no head or 
appointing officer of any national or local government office, agency, or instrumentality, including government-owned or controlled corporation, shall, except upon prior approval of COMELEC, appoint or hire any new employee in the civil service, whether permanent, provisional, temporary, substitute, or casual. However, um, no prior approval from COMELEC is necessary with, refer, uh, with respect to hiring or appointment of workers under contract service and job order whose services are neither covered by the civil service law, rules and regulation not considered as government service. Number two, renewal of appointments of temporary casual substitute and contractual personnel are likewise not covered by this pro prohibition. Now, let us go to the definition of what is an appointment. An appointment is the selection by the authority vested with the power of an, of an individual to, who is to exercise the function of a given office. When completed, usually by its confirmation, the appointment results in security te of tenure for the person chosen unless he is replaceable at pleasure because of the nature of his office. Please note, however, that the prohibition on transfer or detail of employees does not cover uh, designation. Designation may uh, connote the imposition by law or of additional duties of an incumbent official. It is considered only an acting or temporary assignment which does not co cover security of tenure on the person's name. Now, aside from appointment or hiring, it is also prohibited to create and fill any new positions. Okay. So, draw yan. Ang prohibition dyan, no? Uh, yung transfer or detail uh, during uh, for election period, transfer or detail of employees and suspension of elective provincial city municipal or barangay officer. For campaign period, bawal yung appointment or hiring of new employees and create and fill in new positions. Now, Comenet provided um, a situation where there is an urgent need to appoint or hire new employees. When there is an urgent need to appoint or hire new employees and such employees have already been appointed or hired without prior authority from COMELEC, the requesting office or agency shall notify COMELEC in writing within three days from the date of appointment or hiring. The exact date when the position became vacant, number two, the cost of vacancy, number three, the reason for the urgency of the appointment or hiring, and number four, all necessary data or information regarding the same. The key term here is that the appointment or the hiring must be urgent. How do you know if it is urgent? The requisites are the following. Number one, the position is essential to the proper functioning of the office or agency concerned. The position has been vacated by death, retirement, resignation, promotion, or transfer of the regular incumbent. Third, the appointment is issued within 60 days from the occurrence of the vacancy. Fourth, the vacancy cannot be filled by promotion or transfer of insiders within the same period. And lastly, the position shall not be filled in any manner that may influence the election. Now, as to promotion, salary increases, and grant of privileges during the campaign period, this is absolutely and strictly prohibited. So from May 20, from for March 25, 2022 to May 8, 2022, the promotion or giving of increase of salary or remuneration or privilege to any government official or employee, including those in government-owned and controlled corporations, shall be strictly prohibited. What is a promotion? A promotion is the advancement 
of an employee from one position to another with an increase in duties and responsibilities as authorized by law and usually accompanied by an increase in salary. Promotion may be from one department or agency to another or from one organizational unit to another in the same agency. What is increase of salary? Increase of salary shall include adjustments in salaries as a result of increase in pay level of upgrading of position which do not require a change in qualification requirement and do not require the issuance of a new appointment. What is giving of remuneration or privilege? Shall include giving the bonuses other than the mandated 13-month pay and cash gift for government employees, incentives, representation, transportation allowances known as RATA or other forms of allowances regularly received on top of their usual benefits and privileges. So, yun ang coverage ng uh, resolution number 10742, yung mga bawal sa during the election period and the campaign period. Now, let us now go to the last topic. This is covered by Comelec resolution number 10732, which are guidelines for the conduct of in-person campaigns, rallies, caucuses, meetings, and conventions, motorcades and caravans, and meeting the avance under the new normal conditions in connection with the May 9, 2022 national and local elections. On May 20, on November 24, 2021, the Comelec and Bank issued Resolution Number 10732, providing for guidelines institutionalizing the new normal in the conduct of in-person campaigns, rallies caucuses, meetings and conventions, motorcades and caravans, and meeting the advance for the May 9, 2022 national and local election to address the continuing threat of the COVID-19 transmissions. However, all candidates and their campaign support staff of voting age who are going out of their residence to participate in election campaigns shall be recognized as authorized person outside of residence or the APOR during the election period regardless of the alert level and the vaccination status. What is an election campaign activity covered under this resolution? It refers to an act designed to promote the election or defeat of a particular candidate or candidates to a public office and shall include, among others, holding political caucuses, conventions, meetings, rallies, motorcades, and other assemblies or gatherings or in-person campaigns for the purpose of soliciting votes and or undertaking any campaign or propaganda for, against, for or against a candidate. Number two, making speeches, announcements, or holding interviews for or against the election of any candidate for public office. Number three, distributing campaign materials designed to support or oppose the election of a candidate. So, ano mga rules dito? Subject to the prevailing IATF MEID guidelines, all persons participating in election campaigns in whatever capacity are mandated to wear full coverage face shields together with face masks and observe the minimum health standards at all times during the period of political activity. Any person below 18 years of age those who are over 85 years of age and those with immunodeficiency, comorbidity, or other health risks, and heavily pregnant women are not allowed to join, participate, or take part in any political caucuses, conferences, meetings, rallies, motorcades, or other similar assemblies for the purpose of soliciting votes and or undertaking any campaign or propaganda for or against a candidate. Now, for this purpose, COMELEC created different committees. We have the National COMELEC Campaign Committee. We have the Regional COMELEC Campaign Committee, the Provincial COMELEC Campaign Committee, and the Municipal City COMELEC Campaign Committee. The composition of the National COMELEC Campaign Committee composed of the Commissioner in Charge, which present is Commissioner Ray Bulay, uh, 
as chairperson with members consisting of the security secretary of the DOH, the BNP chief, the AFP chief, and the secretary of the DILG. The regional, provincial, and the municipal and city COMELEC campaign committee are chaired by the highest COMELEC official in the area. And as members, the counterparts from the DOH, the PNP, the AFP, and the DILG. The rule here in this resolution is that all election campaign activity requires the prior approval of the cor corresponding campaign committees before the same is conducted. Applications for the conduct of election campaign activities shall be filed at least 72 hours prior to the intended schedule before the following committees. For presidential, vice presidential, senatorial, and party list candidates, the application should be filed with, with the regional COMELEC campaign committee. For gub gubernatorial, vice gubernatorial, district representative, and Sangguniang Panlalawigan candidates, it shall be filed with the provincial COMELEC campaign committee. For the for mayoralty, vice mayoralty, and Sangguniang Bayan Pandunsod candidates, it shall be filed in the municipal or city campaign committee. The campaign committee's concern shall, upon evaluation, either approve or deny the application process within 48 hours from receipt thereof. In action of the concern, campaign committee shall be deemed an approval of the application. The resolution uh, also provides that the National Campaign Committee shall have the authority to classify the category level on each region, province, city, and municipality. This category level shall be reviewed by the National Common Campaign Committee every 14 days, or as may be necessary. So, ano yung category levels? A category level refer to an area classification for dealing with COVID-19 covering entire cities and municipalities, provinces, and regions, aimed to manage and minimize the risk of the disease during election campaigns. Through pertinent DOH and IATF resolution issuance and guidelines, as they may be classified by the respective COMELEC campaign committees. So we have five category level. Category level one, two, three, four, and five. So uh, for category level one, it refers to alert level one under the IATF alert level system. Category two, alert level two. Category three, alert level three. Category four, alert level four. And category five, alert level five. Now, let us now go to specific campaign activities and what are prohibited, what are allowable, what, what is allowed, and what are what are those prohibited? For in-person campaign, this refers to a form of campaigning wherein a candidate and his or her supporters personally visit the voters through house-to-house -house and other sorties in public places, distribute leaflets, give away sample ballots, campaign materials, and, and other goods or items allowed under Republic Act 9006, known as the Fair election act. So for category level one, which is alert level one, there is no limit. For category level two, which is alert level two, a candidate or campaign leader may be accompanied by a maximum of five campaign support staff. For ca category level three, a candidate or campaign leader may, may be accompanied by a maximum of three campaign support staff. For category level four and five, in-person campaigns are prohibited. Now, what are prohibited during in-person campaigns? Number one, bawal to enter any private dwelling during house-to-house -house campaigning, even with the express permission of the homeowner. Number two, bawal din yung crowding or allowing their to be crowds that violates the uh, minimum standards, public health standards, around the candidate and his or her companions. Bawal din yung handshakes. 
have cases going arm to arm or any action that involves physical contact among candidates, their companions, and the public. Bawal din yung taking selfies, photographs, and or other similar activities that require close proximity between the candidate and their companions and the public. And lastly, bawal yung distribution of food and drink and all other goods or items. So yan ang mga bawal for in-person campaigns. For caucuses, meetings, convention, rallies, and meeting the avance, um, okay, what are these, what do you mean by caucuses, meetings, and conventions? This refer to a meeting of people held indoors for the purpose of soliciting votes and or undertaking any campaign or propaganda for or against a candidate. Rally refers to a mass or concerted action held in a public place, indoor or outdoor, for the purpose of soliciting votes and or undertaking any campaign or propaganda for or against a candidate. Meeting the advance refers to a public rally conducted by any candidate, political party, party under the party list system, or coalition on the last day of the campaign period. Now, um, what are the restrictions here? For category level one, allowed up to 70% of the operational capacity of the venue, whether indoor or outdoor. For category two and category three, up to 50% of the operational capacity of the venue. Uh, but for category level two, indoor, or outdoor for category level three for enclosed outdoor only. For category four, allowed an, up to 30% of the operational capacity of the venue for enclosed outdoor only. And for category five, bawal ang caucuses, meetings, convention, rallies, and meeting advance. Now let us go to uh, the prohibition during caucuses, meetings, and conventions. Meeting the avance and rallies. Bawal yung handshakes, going arm to arm, or any kisses, no? Or any action that involves physical contact among the candidate, their companions, and the public. Bawal din yung as mentioned earlier, taking selfies, photographs, and other similar activities that require close proximity between a candidate and their companions and the public. Bawal din yung distribution of food and drink and all other goods and items. Now, uh, as to motorcades and caravans, what are motorcades and caravans? This refer to an organized procession of vehicles traveling together that move along a sidewalk public or private street, highway or expressway conducting exclusively for election campaign purposes. Dito naman sa motorcades and caravans, ang dinidiscuss dito yung capacity of the vehicle. For uh, trucks, buses, mini trucks, and jeepneys, for category 1, up to 70% of the capacity. <coughs> category 2, 50% of the capacity, category 3, 50% of the capacity, category 4, 30% of the capacity of the vehicle, and category 5, not allowed yung ating uh, motorcades and caravans. For service security vehicles, sedans, and owner type jeepneys, for category 1 and category 2, full capacity, pwede yan. For category 3, allowed up to 2 passengers per row, and one passenger on the driver's row. For category four, allowed up to two passengers per row and one passenger for on the driver's row. For category five, bawal. Ang uh, motorcades and caravan. For tricycles, for category one and two, full capacity. For category three and four, one passenger on the sidecar and one back ride passenger. For category 5, bawal ang tricycles sa motorcades and uh, rally. Motorcades and caravans. For motorcycles, category 1 and 2, one back ride passenger, pwede. 
For category 3 and 4, no backride passengers allowed. And category 5, motorcycles are not allowed. Now, uh, under this resolution, it, it is directed that all election campaign activities that in all acti uh, campaign election activities, candidates and participants shall at all times observe the minimum health standards. These refer to guidelines set by the Department of Health and such other issuance subsequent thereto, as well as sector re relevant guidelines issued by the national government agencies as authorized by the IATF. Specifically, number one, to ensure adequate air circulation and ventilation maintenance of physical distancing of one meter or more, proper usage of face masks and other personal protective equipment as may be necessary. Now, these are the rules on campaigning that is applicable now. However, please note that this was approved by COMELEC on November 24, 2021. Uh, as we have observed lately, uh, COVID infections are going down, and this may the rules may change according to what the ITF and COMELEC may later on agree on the different category levels. So, this uh, just wait for new announcements as to what category level a certain region or territory will uh, will have, and these rules will necessarily apply to them. Okay, that would be all. So thank you, thank you very much for listening. I hope may napulut kayo one or two uh, rules. And please, if you are engaged in campaign, please observe these rules. Salamat po sa inyo lahat. Wow, that was a very comprehensive talk. Thank you, Commissioner Ko, for sharing your expertise in the field of election law. Again, please be advised that you may send your questions or comments through the Zoom chat box during the program. You may send it to us directly or to everyone. Hence, please reserve your questions for later. This will serve as our open forum. Now, let's keep the ball rolling. Our next guest graduated Magna Cum Laude in the San Beda College with a degree in AP Political Science. He then finished his Bachelor of Laws in the University of the Philippines. He also became the president of the Law Student Government in UP. He was a former commissioner in the years 2006 to 2013. He also became a member of the Constitutional Commission of 1986 and served as the Vice Chairman of Government Panel for Talks with CPP, NPA and NDF from, it's three from 1996 to 2006. He also became the Deputy Presidential Advisor on the Peace Process from 2004 and the OIC Presidential Advisor on the Peace Process from 2005 to 2006. Ladies and gentlemen, let's all welcome Commissioner Rene Sarmiento. Maraming salamat, uh, Ara and uh, Andrea, for that uh, kind introduction. My topic this afternoon is voting wisely, voting proactively, the best role of law students in true, honest, and free elections. My start by uh, my salutation and congratulations. My salutation, my greetings to our Dean Emeritus, uh, Dean Hara, to our very uh, hardworking Dean, uh, Dean Rocky, the mighty rock of the Cordilleras, our lovely Vice Dean, Cheska, my co-faculty in the San Beda University College of Law and students of San Beda University and attendees our future leaders who will give us a bright tomorrow. And of course, my congratulations to the Office of the Dean for holding the first colloquium in honor of our 
esteemed and venerable Dean Virgilio Hara, with whom I had many memorable memories as my, as my dean in the San Beda College of Law. Salamat po din sa mga suporta mo when I was when you were the dean of our College of Law. He made possible our first seniors constitutional convention in San Beda College of Law and the approval without difficulty of uh, the human rights advocates. Maraming maraming salamat po, Dijin Hara. Which is why I did not hesitate to accept the alluring invitation to uh, talk this afternoon. And the invitation was extended by our dynamic and lovely Vice Dean Cheska. Now, you will ask, my dear students, why is this topic very important to all of us? Number one, this is consistent with the best of documents, internationally and locally. It is consistent with Article 21, Section 3, can we move forward the uh, PowerPoint? Who is assisting me in this presentation? Okay, thank you, thank you. Mr. Could... Martin Tampo is assisting you. Thank you, po, Commissioner. Salamat po, salamat po. Article 21, Section 3, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is about elections. We all know that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is the mother of all human rights declarations all over the world. Now, Article 21, Section 3 provides the will of the people shall be expressed in periodic and genuine elections, which shall be by universal and equal suffrage by secret vote or free voting procedures. Very consistent with our topic this afternoon. Also consistent with Article 5 on suffrage of the 1987 Constitution with Article 9, C, para, Section 1, Paragraph 3 of the uh, 1987 Constitution on the Commission on Elections. Again, speaks of free, honest, orderly election. Article 7, Section 52, of the Omnibus Election Code. And of course, we cannot disregard why this topic is important. It is consistent with the rule of St. Benedict, chapter 72, which is now found in the 10 hallmarks of Benedictine education. Hallmark number 10, which is called to serve the common good. So all of us bedans, from professors to uh, students and to members of uh, the community, we are called to serve the common good as children of St. Benedict. And also, this is important because our first national, this is our first national and local elections during the pandemic with new rules on campaigning and prohibitions mentioned by my friend Commissioner Ko so that we'll be electing our first pandemic president and first pandemic vice president. Hopefully, hindi po anemic, no? Hindi po anemic. And, of course, at a time when the bar exams had just been concluded that will produce the first pandemic bar candidates and pandemic lawyers. So this explains why this topic is important, relevant to all of us Bedans. Now, you will ask also, why is this the best role for us law students? because the topic speaks of role of law students. And to me, this is the best role in the context of the national and local elections. 
best role because law students, you will be difference makers, life shapers, and you will impact history. Remember that it was a student Rizal while in Madrid and then Spain who wrote El Filbosterismo et Nolimi Tangere. It was a young law student, a freshman law student of the Pontifical University of Santo Tomas, Emilio Jacinto, who joined the revolution and became the brains of the Katipunan and drafted the immortal Cartilla ng Katipunan, which to me could rival America's declaration of independence. And remember that it was, it was a student, Benedict, a student at Rome at the time, who left Rome because of paganism, went to Subiaco, and now established the Benedictine order. Remember also, it was a student by the name of Bede or Beda at Jaro, England, who decided to devote his time to a life of teaching, a life of scholarship, a life of study. So these are the impact of students in our history, and you also can impact our history. When we vote for, not only vote, but also campaign for wise, competent, ethical, and compassionate servant leaders, it means a vote for good governance translated into many things and blessings, achieving the values and ideals set forth in the preamble of the 1987 Constitution. Remember that our preamble is Benedictine. It also mentions hallmark number 10 of the Benedictine education, which is promotion of the common good. A book was written in 2012 by a professor of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and professors, professor of the University of Chicago. The name is Darwin Asimuglo of Turkish descent, Turkish American, and James Robinson. What did, they, what did they write? They wrote the book, Why Nations Fail. It's a best-selling book in 2012 and even after 2012. The two authors studied the rise and fall of so many nations and governments all over the world. And many of these nations had already disappeared. Others still existing. What did they say? Ano ba ang kanilang uh, resulta sa pag-aaral? Nogales, Sonora is a place in Mexico. There is also a Nogales, Arizona. They have the same culture, the same history, the same tradition, the same people, but there is a dividing line, a dividing line between the two. It's a boundary dividing Nogales, Arizona from Nogales, uh, Sonora, which is in Mexico. Nogales, Arizona is a progressive place, a progressive community. While Nogales, Sonora, Mexico is not a progressive community. Malayo po sa Nogales, Arizona. Where lies the difference according to this book between these two countries? They even cited South Korea and North Korea and other countries because of good governance. They have good governance, good institutions, in Nogales, Arizona, compared to the kind of governance and institution in Nogales, Sonora, Mexico. In other words, good governance through good leaders, elected leaders, appointed leaders, will spell a big difference in terms of the progress and success of a community, of a city, or country. That's why our vote for competent, ethical, and compassionate servant leaders will mean a lot. Wag lang po sa popularity, 
but is he ethical, consistent with our Benedictine education? The values na pinuturo po, nat, pinuturo po sa atin sa San Beda. Is he wise? Is he compassionate? A heart for others? I think these are the qualities no? na hahanapin po natin sa isang kandidato. From the president up to the municipal or local government officials. Can we move forward? Now, what are these blessings galore? If you vote for this kind of good leaders, number one is an inclusive and robust economic system where there's less disparity, inequality between the rich and the poor, less malnourished children, less unemployed, better educational opportunities for our students. Number two, a just, humane, and working tripartite system of government should be government. Where the two principles of check and balance of blending and blending of powers interplay, and each one not interfering in the affairs and activities of a separate branch of government. Number three, a globally competitive educational system earning the respect of other countries and the best institutions of this world. You know, uh, fellow students, I was reading this uh, Sunday issue of Lifestyle Magazine of Philippine Star, the Lifestyle Sunday section. And what caught my attention was a column by guest columnist Gretchen Ho, who is a Filipino television presenter. Her topic was game on how Harvard taught how Harvard taught me the business of sports. She attended a four day short course in Harvard University. And it was a short course on the business of entertainment, media and sports at Harvard Business School. Now, what did she find out? This was her discovery. She was with famous sportsmen, sportscasters, businessmen. They studied the, case, uh, the cases of LeBron James, Jay-Z, Beyonce, Walt Disney, Netflix, and how Nike developed its iconic sneaker culture. Case studies about these persons and about these businesses. And this was his lamentable discovery. To be honest, according to Gretchen Ho, the whole time I was there, I felt like I was always 10 steps behind in the discussion. It was not because I couldn't catch up but because the situation in our country always felt like 10 steps behind. 10 steps behind. And to think that Gretchen Ho is a graduate of the best school in Katipunan. But this was his finding, her finding. We are 10 steps behind. Okay? Other schools in the world. And one of them is Harvard. Now, under a kind of good leadership and competent leadership that we will have, through your vote, through your vote, then we can be ensured of a globally competitive educational system. Remember that one vote is very important. Yours truly was a member of the Constitutional Commission that drafted the 1987 Constitution. It was only by a slim margin of one vote, one vote. That's why we have a bicameral system of legislature, not a unicameral. Again, by a slim margin of one vote. That shows how important your vote will be in the forthcoming elections.
And then lastly, a human rights sensitive law enforcement system that is consistent with the instrument, with the documents that we study in human rights law in San Beda University and San Beda College, Alabang. Please move forward. Now, again, why is your vote very important? Why is your participation in ensuring honest and free elections very important? Rizal at 26, about your age or some of you, when he wrote El Filibusterismo, The Reign of Greed, the immortal El Filibusterismo. And what did he say in this book? Like government, like people, like masters, like slaves. The kind of government that we have will shape, will define, will influence our people. The kind of masters that we have will define the nature of the slaves. The kind of father and mother that we have in our families will influence, define our children. The kind of professors that we have, you have, in law school and wherever you are, will define who you are in the years to come as students and as lawyers of this republic. Kindly move forward. Now, why youth vote and why youth campaign? As I have said, you are life shapers and difference makers. Remember David and Goliath? Between the ages of 15 and 19, when David slayed the nine feet, nine inches tall Goliath, a giant, then and now, believing in God Almighty, the power of the Almighty. David was saying he's a big target, difficult to miss. And the rest is biblical history. And of course, you have Rizal, whose writings influenced the 1896 revolution, influenced Emilio Jacinto, influenced Apolinario Mabini, and many others up to this very day. So youth vote is very important and youth campaign is very important. Now, according to Comelec data, out of the 62 million registered voters, 62 million, 52% belong to age group 18 to 40 years old. 18 to 40 years old. This is your age, okay? 18 to 40 years old. We are way beyond this age. Professor Nica Banero will be beyond this age. Professor Rock Delson. Yung ating vice dean, baka nasa before 40 years old pa lang yan, no? So 18 to 40 years old. Now, we go to the USA. What was the role of youth vote in the USA during the last presidential elections and during the time of Barack Obama? In the 2020 US presidential election, Joseph Biden won in Georgia a Republican friendly state and they call a swing state, a swing state. He won by a slim margin of 0.23% over Donald Trump or 11,799 votes. And Biden won the age group under 50 years old, the college educated voters. I saw on television, sa CNN po, even Filipinos, okay, were rooting and campaigning actively for Biden in Georgia. What about in Arizona? 
another Republican friendly state. Biden won a slight margin of 0.3% over Trump, or 10,000 votes. Again, who spelled the difference? Young voters, college educated voters. In 2008, this was the contest between McCain and Obama. And yours truly had the blessing of being there to represent the Commission on Elections. 66% of those under age 30, that will be your age, voted for Barack Obama, the first Black American president. In 2012, 60%, again, of those under age 30 voted for Barack Obama. In other words, young voters, you voters, are difference makers. You shape history. You shape destiny of countries. Now, what about in the Philippines? 31-year-old Biko Soto broke a political dynasty in Pasig, Pasig City. And although I have no comelic figures about the youth vote, sana po ang ating comelic, no? We'll gather data about youth vote, about women vote, et cetera, et cetera, no? To guide us. They have no comelic figures. I am most inclined to believe that young voters chose Vico Soto. And during the pandemic, we all know he received positive media reactions and public attention. And he won with this number, 206,226 or 63.27 against Bobby Eusebio, 119,726 or 36.73%. Okay. Can we move on? So therefore, young students of law and future leaders of this republic, I say future leaders, future leaders because you're the future senators, future presidents, future judges and justices and commissioners of this country. Just this afternoon, I received a message from a text message from my former student in San Beda, who is now a judge. I congratulated the Ching Meneses and I said, Thank you very much, Poo, sir. I'll bring with me the lessons I have learned from you. Just today, I have received that message. So, what is now your imperative and compelling option? Yours is to vote not to boycott, to vote wisely, and to vote proactively. Hindi lang po boboto, you have to campaign actively for your favorite candidate. Again, not only to vote proactively, but also to educate voters. Why not involve yourself in non-governmental organizations like PPCRV, Justice Palma, Cecilia Ms. Palma Foundation, and several others that are educating our voters. Work with Preso, it's an organization working for uh, people deprived or persons deprived of liberty, and will be conducting education in detention centers because we have in our country only one of the few countries which allow detainee voting. And secondly, <clears throat> beyond 2022 elections, we have what we call political process monitoring, assessing performance of elected officials based on campaign promises. After the election, at sila po in halal, gagampanan ba nila ang kanilang panunumpa to serve the public? 
Will they be true to their election plans? That's why I'm an advocate, uh, students of uh, what I call election plans. Not only integrity plans after filing the COC, but an election plans that even after the election, they will work devotedly and faithfully true to their campaign promises. And the leading non-governmental and non-partisan organization <clears throat> in this political process monitoring is the National Democratic Institute based in Washington, USA. And this uh, institute, <clears throat> together with uh, partner governments in several countries, have conducted this political process monitor. I hope you young law students and future lawyers, you not only vote wisely, vote proactively, but also involve yourself in political process monitoring for the good of this country and what we call in San Beda, the common good. Kindly move on. Okay. I think you all know the late Senator Diokno. He's not the young child Jokno, he's the son of the Senator of Senator Jokno. A known civil libertarian, a public servant, a senator, and served once upon a time as his uh, Secretary of Justice. I think you're familiar with the case of Stonehill versus Jokno. The landmark case of Stonehill versus Jokno, uh, where the ponencia was spent by another Bedan, Chief Justice Roberto. Conception, following the dissent of uh, another Bedan in a previous case, and which is now the majority opinion in Stonehill versus Jokno, the dissent of uh, Justice Montemayor. This is now the Stonehill versus Jokno. Another time, Jokno was the Secretary of Justice. He formulated the six Jokno principles to promote and defend human rights. We study this in human rights law in San Beda University and also in San Beda College, Alabang. And I'll just mention six, I'll mention three, which are relevant to all of us. What did he say? What are these three principles relevant to our topic? He said, do not act as one, act as a group. Work with organizations. The more number, the better. Number two, work with other organizations here and abroad devoted to the same cause of uh, promoting peaceful, honest, fair elections. And then make full use of human rights education. Please remember the right to vote, the right of a suffrage is a fundamental human right that we have to exercise as citizens of this republic. Now I conclude. I ask our, our vice dean, Chesa, vice dean, what is the duration of my presentation? Baka humaba po, no? Asok pa po kayo, Komish. Sabi ni vice dean, hoy, isang oras, no? <clears throat> so, ganun po kabait po ang ating Vice Dean. No? Our Vice Dean was a fo my former student in San Beda. Napakasipag po niya, no? At through the years, through the years, no? She has maintained that charism, no? That beauty, no? Yan po sa ating Eskwela San Beda University. At napakabait po, no? If I have queries, she's only a text away or phone call away. So, Cheska, maraming salamat po, ha? Thank you very much. Thank you, Komish. Nagkataon, ninong ako ni Cheska sa kasal po, eh. <laughs> At maraming sa members of the faculty po ay eh, kanyang mga ninong. <clears throat> Now, I go to conclusion. I think you remember Solomon's prayer in the Book of Kings. What did he pray? As a young king, 
He said, Lord, I am so young. I do not know how to govern this great people. So I ask, dear Lord, an understanding mind to govern your people, to be able to discern what is good and what is evil. That was his prayer, and that was granted. He didn't ask for the lives of his enemies for long life, but for wisdom, so lahat po binigay sa kanya. Now, how applicable to our topic today? Very applicable. We ask in the course of our voting and campaigning, for wisdom, for an understanding heart. And this is not far from our Benedictine motto, which is, Cheska, ano pang Benedictine motto? Cheska. Cheska? Um, Komish marami po, ora et labora. Ayan, ayan, di ba? Ora et labora. Alam niyo ho ba, while dying, okay, the words that St. Benedict was Saying, ora et labora. Those were his dying words, no? And encouraging his fellow monks always to work for peace. Work for peace. So that's why, how that's important, ora et labora. And very important to Solomon, the ora. And also remember the, the dying word, the dying prayer of St. Bede. You know St. Bede or San Beda? He wrote the famous and immortal history, ecclesiastical history of the English people. No? Isang sikat pong Englishman and revered no, for his scholarship and writings. That's why we have San Beda. And what did he say? His very last word before he died. This was the line he said. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. And he closed his eyes and died peacefully. So students of San Beda, and of course this includes members of the faculty, my co-faculty, in our work to campaign for our chosen candidates, for us to vote wisely, okay? Let us remember Solomon and his request for wisdom for understanding heart. And let us also remember St. Benedict's last words, ora et labora, and St. Bede's last line, glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. For our elections, for our law studies, and even beyond these elections, and our law studies. Maraming maraming salamat po sa inyong lahat. Thank you so much po, Commissioner Sarmiento, for sharing about the role of students in true, honest, and free elections. This truly serves as an inspiration to accept our role in nation building by casting our votes. Now, this lecture is in honor of a core member of our institution in the San Beda University College of Law, Dean Emeritus Virgilio B. Hara. He was the former Dean of San Beda University College of Law for 20 years. He graduated with a Bachelor of Laws in San Beda College, now San Beda University, and placed fifth in the 1962 bar examination. On behalf of the family of Dean Emeritus Virgilio B. Hara, here is a pre-recorded video of thanks by his grandson. Good afternoon. My name is Enzo Hara Abatayo, and I'm a philosophy major currently studying at the Ateneo de Manila University. Dean Virgilio Hara is my grandfather, and on behalf of Lolo and the whole family, we are deeply moved by the gesture of my grandfather's colleagues at the College of Law for naming this colloquium lecture series after him. 
We would also like to thank the speakers, former Comelec Commissioners René Visarmiento and Antonio Co, for their timely reminders regarding our duties and responsibilities as good voters and citizens. Please feel comfortable to ask questions, and my grandfather's former student, attorney Edward Gialogo, and as well as my grandfather's friend, Commissioner René, will answer your queries. Thank you, and once again, good afternoon. Wow, that was a very moving message. Um, the San Beda College of Law will not be where it is now if not for Dean Emeritus Harris' remarkable contributions in our academic institution. Now to answer the most pressing issues about election laws, let us welcome back to the virtual floor, Commissioner Sarmiento. Joining Commissioner Sarmiento is Attorney Edward Gayalogo. Attorney Edward Gayalogo graduated from the San Beda University College of Law in 2010. He has worked as consultant in the Finance Services Department of the Commission on Elections, or COMELEC, in 2015 for the Office of the Governor of Nueva Ecija and Office of the Mayor in the Municipality of Talavera, Nueva Ecija. He served in the Office of the COMELEC Chairman 6 to S. Brillantes as an attorney for from 2011 to 2015. He was also an associate director of the tax division in CSIP, Gores, Velayo, and Co. And Co. In 2016 and 2017, ladies and gentlemen, let us all welcome attorney Edward Gayalogo. Thank you very much, Ara and uh, Andrea, no, for the introduction. Uh, Tama po yung sinabi ni Commissioner Sarmiento, napaka-relevant at napaka-importante ng boto ng mga kapataan. Because... Uh, as uh, mentioned in the, the, the past press release of the COMELEC, almost 52% of the voters are between age, ages 18 to 40. That's why the, the votes of the youth uh, are very, very important and relevant. So let's now have our open forum. Andrea, Andrea, Ara. Magaling pong isudyante yan. Magaling isudyante ko po yan. Magaling pong isudyante yan si ano. Si Edward. Salamat po, kumpine. Can the motion? Oh, can the motion? <laughs> so for any questions, please send your your questions to the Zoom chat box. Uh, you may either direct your message to me or Andrea, or you can send it to everyone. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think we can start with a few questions that we already received earlier today. Okay, po. Thank you. Okay, so here's one question, po, uh, from the chat box. Good day, po. Is there a rule on confidentiality in discussing the deliberations of COMELEC? Can separate opinions be released before the resolution? If not, what can be the sanction or liability of an erring commissioner? Thank you so much. Okay, may I comment on that and Edward will uh, will follow, no? Okay, thank so, you, Commissioner. Of course, we have a rule on strict confidentiality. The provision is section, section 58 of the Omnibus Election Code, which provides that we are governed. Now, the, the section provides canon of judicial ethics, but that is 1946 version. The latest is the Code of Judicial Conduct. So it applies to us commissioners as quasi-judicial officers. So there is secrecy, confidentiality, and rule against premature release of our opinions until it is officially promulgated. I think you are referring to the latest case of uh, Commissioner Guanson, the Guanson Ferulino controversy, no? But I have a qualification. I have a qualification with respect to my answer. You have to place in context what Commissioner Guanson has done in context because we have the immediacy test, urgency test, and totality of circumstances test as mentioned by the Supreme Court in several cases, even by Justice Marvick Leonen, our chairman of the bar examination. Number one, Commissioner Guanson at that time was soon to retire. Okay, number two, the importance of the issue 
it is an issue or case of national import. We cannot wait because ours is automated election. And if we have to follow, ito pang sabi niya, there is intervention, political intervention. That's why it is not being released. If you ask me now, was she justified despite this prohibition? Okay, because of the urgency, immediacy, national significance of this case, then we have to understand the position of Commissioner Guanson. That is my answer. Yeah, uh, I also agree with uh, Commissioner Rene Sarmiento no, that uh, there is such a prohibition as in fact, uh, uh, the COMELEC has a specific resolution on this. No? It's uh, resolution uh, 2048-A, no? which was promulgated during the time of uh, Chairman Munsod, which states that uh, the deliberations and uh, the ponente of a case is supposed to be confidential. And uh, if anyone uh, violates that uh, resolution, the, the, the one who violates can be held uh, criminally or administratively liable. But uh, I also concur with the qualifications uh, stated by uh, Commissioner Rene Sarmiento no, that uh, uh, there, there is an urgency in this case. And if I may add, Ara, to your question, <clears throat> Ara, number one, additional point, other than the resolution mentioned by our dear attorney, Edward Yal. We were together in the COMELEC po, no, si Edward. Napakasimpal po niyan. Yan po ang main consultant advisor ni, ni Chairman Sixto Brillantes. Number one, it appears it is a contest, a fight in Tramular in the first division, but it affects the whole commission. Anong ginagawa ng chairman ng commission no elections? Is the primus inter pares, the first among equals, the first to mediate, to reconcile, to lead? He was silent all along when this case was simmering, no? was boiling to the highest point. So as the good father of the family, ano man lang kung tinawag niya lahat at sinabihan, tapusin na natin ito. Ano man lang kung sinabi niya, pagbigyan mo na si Commissioner Guanzon, si is retiring, patapos na yan. This will be her last hurrah. Pagkatapos wala na siya, makakalmutan si Commissioner Guanzon. Hindi po. Na, ngayon, our Commissioner Carolyn was saying, eh nagkasakit po yung aking abogado okay, na COVID. But, there are many lawyers in the COMELEC. You ask attorney Gialogo, napakarami. So if your lawyers are sick, get the assistance of the lawyers from the law department. There are many bedans right now in that, uh, in that uh, law department. Can they not help you? Or if they're not available, can you not as commissioner draft the resolution? You have that responsibility as commissioner. Di ho ba? E di sulatin mo, gumawa ka, kaya nga ng commissioner ka eh. So those are my reflections on this uh, issue. That's why uh, I think, uh, well, up to now, the decision has not been... Edward, na release ba yung decision? Hindi pa po eh. Hindi pa, first case, of, sa first, sa second division, na release na yung division <laughs> ruling. Sa end bank, lumabas na rin. Pero ito sa first division and disqualification, hindi pa. Yan lang po, Ara. And thank you, Edward. Thank you so much po, Attorney Gialobo and Commissioner Sarmiento for answering the question po. Ms. Manuel, do you have, so have any another, other question? Yes po, we have another question po. Um, sabi po, Sir, which prevails regarding the qualifications for president? Provisions from the Constitution or provisions of law regarding the candidate? Edward, gusto mong sagutin yan? Ano yun ang constitutional expert yan si Edward? <laughs> Hindi uh, po. Ano, uh, I think that my answer should be supplemented uh, by Commissioner Sarmiento. Pero ito lang masasabi ko. Ano. Uh, we have to uh, distinguish the qualifications and the ground for these qualifications. Okay? So the qualifications of uh, the President are stated in the Constitution. Okay? And in, eh, no law can add any uh, additional requirement for a person to be qualified as President. Kung ano nakalagay sa Constitution, Yun yun, okay, but the statutes can provide grounds for disqualifications, right? Na atulad ngayon, meron tayong grounds for disqualifications under the uh, omnibus uh, election code. The revised penal code also provides for 
uh, disqualifications kapag na ka ng mga crimes, no? felonies. Yan, no? So the disqualifications can be provided by statutes but the qualifications uh, cannot be increased by uh, Congress. Ara, Andre, I have nothing more to add. Napakagaling po ng sagot ni Edward. <laughs> Thank you po. Thank you po so much. Um, we have another question po. Ang sabi po, Good day, sir. What is your opinion on BBM's disqualification case? Si Andre Balaka ba nagtatanong? Ito po ang sagot ko uh, po dyan, ha? Oo, oo, alam nyo. Una-una, subjudice. No? Di ho ba? So, as law students, we should not be commenting. So, siguro publicly po, ha? pwede pong Uh, privately, pwede ko ma-share my thoughts on this. No? Yan po ay tinanong sa akin ng mga senior law students ng San Beda, Alabang, no? <laughs> about the disqualification. Yan po ay nasagot ko. But uh, again, uh, following the subjudicial rules. No? Until now, it is pending po sa first division. Hindi pa ho lumalabas. No? So, I will not comment muna. But I think you are too familiar with the case. No? Alam niyo naman ang issue on disqualification about the convictions of RTC, Court of Appeals, etc., etc. So I will not further comment on that question. Commissioner, there is a follow-up question related to the said question po about BBM's case. What will happen if he wins and no ruling, co and yet no ruling was held yet by the COMELEC? And the COMELEC then makes a ruling after he wins. What will uh, happen to his proclamation? Oy, magandang tanong yan ha. No? Magandang scenario yan ha. Now, there are different scenarios. Okay. We go to scenario one. Okay. Scenario one, let's say natapos, na-file yung, ano, natap, na yung uh, uh, umabot sa Supreme Court. Okay. Yung uh, petition from the end bank pumunta po ng uh, COMELEC by way of certiorari. Yung mga four-chair, alam nyo po yan, no? Under Rule 65. Okay. So, nag-eleksyon. Uh, hindi pa nirurule ng, Comelec, ng uh, Supreme Court. Now, one scenario is the Supreme Court will dribble the case. Now, there are cases in the past that I know of, no? when I was in the COMELEC. Sensitive cases, dribble, dribble until the case has been resolved. So, un un yeah, until the, the election has been done. So, sasabihin, moot in academic, the people have spoken. Panalo siya, we have to respect. Okay, that is one scenario. Okay, second scenario. Before the election, okay, before, na-disqualify si, uh, si uh, BBM. Okay. Now, sino ang replacement ngayon? Under the rules mentioned by Commissioner Ko, di ho ba? Because we are automated, same surname. Same surname. So sino yan? Marcos. Pwedeng si Aimee, o kung sino ang Marcos yan, anak ni, ni Bongbong, who is running for, I think, positions, a local position. Pwede rin siya to replace. Okay. Ngayon, Halimbawa, natapos yung eleksyon, nanalo si BBM, na-disqualify. Now, my view, of, now, this is my opinion, baka si Edward mag differ on this. My opinion is that with his disqualification by the Supreme Court after the election, okay, the rule on succession will follow. Now, who will be the, who is the candidate who won as vice president? Siya ngayon ang Pangulo. So I think these are the possible scenarios. No? Alam mo, Edward, very imaginative ang ating mga bedan. Through the years, no? they're very imaginative. No? Maraming mga scenarios na niniisip. Eh. So these are the three possibilities, Ara and Andrea. And to that student to ask the question. Thank you so much, Commissioner Sarmiento. Attorney Guialogo, do you have anything to add po? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with the Commissioner Sarmiento no, that uh, if uh, uh, after the election, assuming uh, BBM uh, wins the election, and after the election, uh, this Supreme Court uh, uh, renders a decision disqualifying him, then it will be the rule of uh, succession. Okay? However, 
meron lang po ako gustong i-share. No? Because uh, may mga kaso kasi na nagagaling sa House of Representatives Electoral Tribunal. Okay? And uh, in the House of Representatives Electoral Tribunal, the uh, losing uh, uh, candidate for congressman can file a protest or petition for Kowaranto. No? And uh, normally, in the petition for Kowaranto, hindi naman nakakaupo yung second placer because second placer is rejected by the people. But there is one case no? uh, in which the Supreme Court, uh, I think it's in the case of uh, Pichai versus uh, Delgado, where the Supreme Court said that uh, if uh, the petition for Kowaranto is granted, Okay, it means that the COC of that uh, candidate was invalid from the very beginning. Therefore, the second placer can sit. Why am I saying this? Kasi po, uh, kapag si BBM ay naproclaim na at nakapag-assume na sa office, then it will now be the Presidential Electoral Tribunal that will have uh, jurisdiction on the matter, on the uh, qualifications of BBM. And what will the petitioner file? It is a petition for Kowaranto. Diba? So, in a petition for Kowaranto, uh, sabi nga doon sa isang Supreme Court decision, uh, pwedeng makancel ang COC at may, pwedeng magkaroon ng same effect as cancellation, pwedeng makaupo ang second place. Yeah, no? Pero ito po, wala pang jurisprudence dito. No? Uh, nasa share ko lang sa inyo na posibleng tingnan din yung mga bagay. Yan. Okay. Uh, Ara, Andrea, may I comment on that? Yung, we call that in election law, second place rule. Okay, that applies to local uh, elected officials. Okay, to mayor. Yeah, nangyari po yan. We have so many cases, no? And some some of them we decided, like Makiling versus Comelec. So, uh, marami po yan, no? So, tama po si Attorney Edward. Wala pa tayong kaso involving president and vice president on second place rule. Okay, pero Pwede rin. That is also a possible scenario. No? Na in, case, in case the protest is elevated to the PET, Presidential Electoral Tribunal, the Supreme Court will now rely on past jurisprudence and apply the same thing. No? So therefore, applying the second place rule, okay, kung sinong nanalong second place, si Laksun kaya, si Leni kaya, si Pacquiao kaya, si Isko, si Yodi, so sila po magiging pangulo ng ating bansa. Thank you so much po for answering Commissioner Sarmiento and Attorney Dialogo. And thank you to Mr. Mark Almenares for that um, very substantial question. Ms. Manuel, do we have any more questions? Yes, so our next question comes from Mr. Ryan Tanaman. Um, he asks, how do we define and apply political rights during this 2022 elections? Okay, may I answer? And Attorney Edward will apply. Human rights will fully apply no, in this election. Lalong lalo na ang political rights like right to vote, right of suffrage, right to participate in electoral processes, so in full play po yung ating political rights this uh, forthcoming election. So we have to exercise because these are respected in the Constitution, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and many other international documents. And even the rule of St. Benedict encourages participation to promote the common good. Yan lang po. Attorney Gialogo, do you have anything to add po? Wala na po. I don't care with the answer of Mr. Sanya. Thank you so much po. Um, our next question is from Mr. Kirby Arafol. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioner Sarmiento. Uh, just a follow-up question regarding Commissioner Guanzon's separate opinion. Should the disqualification case after being decided with finality will be elevated to the Supreme Court? Can the Supreme Court take judicial notice on the separate opinion of Commissioner Guanzon given the aforementioned factual antecedents? Thank you, Po. Okay, Kirby, may I comment on your... Kirby is a first-year law student pala, no? Belonging to Section L. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, what will happen to the separate opinion of uh, Commissioner Guanzon not counted, no? 
the Supreme Court has ruled in one or two cases that after your retirement, okay, your vote, okay, or your yeah, your vote, your opinion will no longer be counted. So wala na po yan, no? So ngayon, what will prevail kung 2-0 yan, 2-0, no? The vote of Casquejo and uh, Filorino. Now, will the Supreme Court take judicial notice of that uh, decision? Well, truth is, it is legally nothing. <laughs> that opinion, no? Pero, since uh, justices are human beings, at tandaan nyo po, han, these are human beings also. Nagbabasa po ng mga decision nito. Outside of the Supreme Court, mga tao din sila with feet of clay. Coming from Mount Olympus, nagbabasa din yan. Nakikisaw-saw din yan. Nakikialam din yan. May mga anak na law students din yan. So, alam din nila. That is part of the judicial notice. Whether to follow Commissioner Guanson or not, uh, that is now their own decision. Thank you for that, po, Commissioner. Attorney Gallego? Uh, uh, wala, wala po kuya dapat tayo. Ano, tama po. <laughs> Sorry po. Uh, Oy, alam niyo ba si Atter Attorney Edward nung isudyante yan, no? Ibang-iba uh, na siya ngayon, eh, no? So, I recall when he was a young law student, ngayon, ang dati niya, abogado, eh. Bigatin abogado. Abogado di kampana pong dating na Attorney Gallego. Kahit na kayo balang araw, no? You will be appearing, or you will be uh, as if you are talagang mga abogado, no? By the way you dress and the way you act and the way you speak. Era, can uh, I add, no. Additionally, um, I was actually a student mm. of Commissioner Sarmiento under evidence, and in relation to the question, I just can't resist but to comment on it also that although, but you might think that it is an act of a commissioner of the Comelec that would have. The, I think the question is stemming from the the um that the student is thinking that it is an act of the government, but it is not. It cannot be a subject of judicial notice because it is the sole act of Commissioner Guanzon. And you know, as you know, the the Commonwealth yeah. acts as a tribunal, whether as a division or as an end bank. And so that cannot be considered as um, a matter that is subject of mandatory or discretionary judicial notice. Especially since it does not fall under any act of the legislative, executive, or judicial department of the government. Mm -hmm. In other words, ara ex na po ex ex commissioner, so wala na pong say say yung kanyang sinabi. But for our public interest and information lang po, no. Thank you so much, Paul, for answering the question, Commissioner Sorimento, and for your additional. Uh, opinion, uh, Vice Dean Francesca Senga. Uh, the next question is from Aldrin Balaka from 1B. When Comelec and Congress added qualifications for president through statute regarding the qualifications, does such action of Comelec and Congress requires to comply the art to Article 17 of the Constitution? Uh, Edward, you can't answer that. Oh. <laughs> Uh, the Congress cannot add any additional requirement no, doon sa mga qualifications na nasa Constitution. Okay? Uh, what, what the Congress can add are uh, grounds for disqualifications. No? So wala namang conflict yun kasi iba naman ang qualifications or eligibility sa grounds for disqualifications. If I may add, Ara, Andrea, no? during our time, we passed a resolution, no? na yung mga kandidato mag-post ng bond, especially yung mga nuisance candidates, no? para magdalawang isip bago mag-file ng uh, candidates. Mag-post kayo ng bond. So, umawad sa Supreme Court yan. So, sabi ng Supreme Court, that is additional qualification. So, the Supreme Court nullified our common resolution. Uh, qualifications, hindi mo pwede. Pero kung disqualifications, tama po si Attorney Edward. Pwede po, naglagan. Thank, Thank you so, so much, much attorney. Po. Ayan, so for our next question, it's from Christian Gabriel Chua of 3G. Good day po. Although mute, although moot, since the candidacy of the current president was withdrawn, 
But can a former president run again for a position other than president? Okay, sino bang mut sino bang nag-withdraw as a president as moot? Si si sino ba tinutukoy ni ano? Si President Duterte po yata. Ah, si President Duterte siya bang tinutukoy mo? So nag-withdraw siya. Okay. So nag-withdraw siya and then ano yung tanong ni ating law student? Um, sabi niya po, uh, can a former president run again for a position other than president? Ay, pwedeng pwede po oh, oh, for another president. Bakit po si GMA? Di ba? Tumakbong congressman. Pwede po. Tumakbong senador. Pwede rin po. In the U.S., John Quincy Adams okay, was the former president of the USA. For his re-election, he lost. So he ran for congressman and he won as congressman and died as a congressman. So pwede po for another position. Thank you so much po, Attorney Sarmiento and Attorney Guialago. Uh, the next question is from John Alfred Rabena from 1E. Good day po, sir. What can you say about the church or religious organizations which are adhering to or are endorsing a particular political color or candidate? How can we reconcile the church's duty to uphold the integrity of the truth and the need to be tolerant towards political opinions of individuals? Ayan. Thank you so, po. Edward, magandang sagutin mo, Edward, diyan. <clears throat> Actually, medyo uh, malago na yung line natin kasi sa, sa, sa separation of church and states. No? Pero uh, ang nakapansin ko lang sa mga jurisprudence is uh, liberal ang uh, Supreme Court dyan sa uh, pa pag-decide uh, in favor of the church. No? Like for example, yung case ng uh, I, I think Archdiocese of uh, Bacolod versus Comilec, no yung merong pare na naglagay ng team buhay, team patay. No? So, uh, sinabi ng uh, Supreme Court that uh, uh, pwedeng gawin yun. No? Ng, uh, kung di ako nagkakamali, sinabi ng Supreme Court na that can be done, meaning hindi siya makukonsider na violation of the uh, rule uh, on separation of church and states. No? So, liberal dyan ang Supreme Court. So, yun po. Mr. Yeah, pwede ako mag-comment dyan. Ano po? <clears throat> According to the uh, Supreme Court in one case where the opponent was Justice Laurel, no? the old Laurel, involving a stamp to celebrate Eucharistic Congress. This was in the 1930s. So ang sabi niya, the church cannot separate itself from involvement on matters that affect morals. Okay? Because religion is ennobling, uplifting to the human soul. Okay? Now, Applying this uh, constitutional principle of church and state separation sa, na, na sa ating saligang batas at sa sinabi ni uh, Justice Laurel, to me, to me, individually, a Catholic, a Protestant, a Baptist can endorse, can campaign actively for a candidate. But the moment a church as an organization, as an entity, no, collectively supports a candidate, that to me would be uh, a little intrusion you know, into the principle of the church and state. Remember that for party list congressmen, party list representatives, bawal po you know, sa isang uh, kandidato to run representing a church or a sect or a denomination. Bawal po. You know? So to me, if it is now the Catholic Church supporting Lenny Robredo, or the INK supporting, let's say, uh, 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 one of the candidates. Mukhang may uh, papasok yung separation of the church and the state. But individually, again, individually, you can all campaign no, for our favorite candidates. So wala pa hong jurisprudence ng hukul po dyan, the church supporting a presidential or a vice presidential candidate. Uh, Era? Yes, Pauline. Uh, ano lang, uh, sasaw-saw lang ako, pero pang ano lang sa akin, pang uh, kwentong barbero lang. Kasi, <laughs> Sir po, thank you po. Marami akong mga kaibigan na mga pare 
and uh, at least uh, three uh, ask for my opinion. Uh, ang ang sa akin uh, dahil nga sabi ni Idol Rene na uh, individually wala namang ano. And of course, if uh, they have uh, concern about uh, good governance, wala namang uh, dapat uh, prohibition sa kanila if uh, they think that uh, uh, going for one choice will give us the best governance. Pero yung yung sinabi ko dun sa kaibigan ko, Father, sabi ko, ang tingin ko kasi ang dapat mong ikampanya si Kristo. Kung hindi si Kristo, yung mga santo. Kasi yung mga santo at saka si Kristo walang issue diyan. Kasi ako ang tinitingnan ko naman yung katayuan mo bilang pare. Ang gusto ko hindi ka mababash sa social media dahil kinampanya mo yung isang kandidato. Pag si Kristo ang ikakampanya mo at ikaw ay ibabash, walang problema, susuportahan ka namin. Pero kapag yung kinampanya mo na, na ordinaryong mortal, ang mga santo kasi, mga tao din yan, but there is a process, talagang tinitingnan ng maigi ng, ng Vatican yan, kung yan ba ay walang sabit. Pero kapag ikaw ay maging personal para sa isang mortal na wala yung, yung proseso na yon baka lang mapasubo tayo, Father. Kasi pagdating ng panahon, baka ikaw ang sisihin at ang masama. Kapag hindi kasi sila naniwala sa iyo, baka pag ikaw ay maghuhumili, baka hindi rin sila maniniwala sa That's the danger of it. Kasi ang gusto ko pag magsalita ka sa sa ano sa homily mo, lahat ng parishioners mo maniniwala sa iyo. Darating ang ano kapag ikaw ay ma-involve kasi sa ganyan. Tapos sa parishioners mo ay isa lang ang bumoto doon sa kandidato mo. Ano ang dating noon? Di ba? Parang, parang mas okay ako, Father, pag hindi ka na sumausaw. Okay na. You give parameters. If you vote, you look for this, you look for these characteristics, okay yun. But avoid, avoid lang na magbanggit ka ng, ng particular. Uh, ano. Kasi alam mo, medyo kaya sabi ko kanina sa opening, pagdating sa eleksyon, Ingat sa puso. Huwag kang ma-high blood. Huwag kang mainis. <laughs> diba? Kasi ang gusto ng iba ay iba sa gusto mo. So iyon. Iyon ang aking uh, sharing. Salamat. Din, salamat. Din, din. Hindi po kwentong barbero yan. To us, it is gospel truth. Yung sinabi mo niyo po. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. <laughs> Thank you so much po, Dean, for that uh, insight po. Um, because of uh, limited time, we can only we can only entertain only two more questions. So, uh, the next question will be from Mr. Lance Christian Reyes. What can you say about the re-election attempt of Joseph Estrada in the 2010 elections? Ah, okay. Mangko comment pa ako jana. Okay. If a president has served one term, so bawal na po yan. Di ba? We learn in in law school, constitutional law, and political law. One term lang ang Pangulo. Okay. So, siya po ay nag-file ng candidacy. Now, inopose po yan. Um, Duman po sa COMELEC yan during our time. Until it reached the Supreme Court. No? It's still during our time. Dinribol po yan. So, natapos ang election. Okay. I think it was resolved after or hindi na resolved. The Supreme Court has spoken, both an academic, the people have spoken. Ganun po. So unresolved po ang issue by the Supreme Court. Thank you so much po for that. Attorney Dialogo, do you have anything to add po regarding uh, the issue on President Estrada? Ito yung magandang uh, issue yan talaga. No? And uh, sana nga, dinisisyonan niya ng Supreme Court. But if you will analyze the wording of the Constitution, nakalagay kasi doon is any re-election is uh, prohibited. No? So kung ako ang tatanungin, uh, it should be strictly interpreted. No? Whether uh, the one uh, pursuing the, 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 the re-election is a sitting president or a past president. No? Kasi any re-election diba, is uh, prohibited. No? Thank you so much po, Attorney Gialogo. So 
Ayan. So, for our last question, uh, sabi niya po, Good afternoon po. Please keep my name anonymous. Here is my question. As a member of the Constitutional Commission of the 1987 Constitution, do you think it is about time for a anti-political dynasty law in accordance with the Constitution or will it impede democracy since there will be a bar on a candidate to run just because of his or her surname? It will improve democracy, Andrea, no? It will improve if we uh, implement or flesh out that constitutional provision in the Declaration of Principles and State Policies. There is a prohibition against political dynasties. Now, you will ask, why did the Commission did not flesh out itong uh, provision na ito? Because after the ratification of the Constitution, there were so many bills filed, no? to flesh out coming from senators, from congressmen, but this were, this were placed in the back burner, no? Hindi to inaksyonan, because if you analyze, you analyze who are in Congress, who are in the House, who are in the Senate. Pag may mga nanalo ngayon sa halala natin sa darating na eleksyon, baka mag-ina, magkakapatid, nandyan po yan. Punta tayo sa Kongreso, sa House, Ganon din yan. Now, according to a study, ito po, a study po, scientific, because of kinship, okay, they control resources, they control political power. And those young candidates, like Attorney Dialogo, no, from Nueva Ecija, pwedeng mag-gobernador yan, eh kung hawak ng mga dynasty ang isang provinsya, ang isang bayan, may pag-asa ka ba? Kahit na napakahusay mo. Sa premature campaigning na lang, Wala kang pero, pero napakagaling mo. Pero hawak na mga dynasty, yung media, yung resources, may panalo ka ba? That is why high time. Now, you, why was it not implemented or, or fleshed out by the CONCON of 1980? Because at the time, at the time, we were thinking, ah, the first Congress will implement. They are full of idealism, full of love of country and patriotism. We were mistaken. We were mistaken. Sad to say we were mistaken. That's why I hope the new batch of congressmen and senators will have the guts and the moral courage mm -hmm. to flesh out that constitutional provision. It will improve democracy. Can I add on that? Can I add something? Totoo po yun, ano? Dahil nga the anti-dynasty rule is in the constitution, pero... Ang problema naman, nahihirapan po talaga gumawa ng enabling state truth. No? But then, uh, siguro naka-first step na rin yung Congress natin in the sense that with respect to the elections of the members of Sangguniang Kabataan, pati yung SK Chairman, yan po nag apply na yung anti-dynasty rule. Such that kung ikaw ay uh, second degree relative ng isang incumbent uh, uh, government official, hindi ka pwedeng maging candidate sa SK. No? So siguro magandang panimulaan na rin yon and uh, hopefully sa mga susunod na kongreso no after this uh, current congress makapag-create na rin ng totoong anti-dynasty law para naman sa ibang uh, local uh, position pati na rin sa national position. And i-share ko lang din ano na dito po sa law office namin uh, we have election clients din kasi alam niyo po ba in, pag pag uh, tinanong ako ilan ang election clients mo ang sinasabi ko X number of families per family ang bilangan namin. Kasi uh, normally talaga, pag may naging client ka sa eleksyon, buong pamilya nagiging kliyente mo na eh. No? Kasi normally, yung mga politiko, pamilya talaga. No? Ganun po siya. Ang set, ang set up talaga nila ngayon. Alam mo, Edward, uh, Aaron, Aaron, Andrea, no? before we part our ways, no, ako po ay bago nagturo sa San Beda, 2006, iinan lang ang mga bidistang pumapasok sa government, no? Bibi, kukunti lang. So, I encourage them. Sabi ko, pumasok kayo sa government, no? Don't deprive government of your talents and abilities. Okay, that was 2006, 2007. Keep on encouraging them. Ngayon, tingnan mo kung sino ang nasa gobyerno ngayon, no? Even before the Duterte administration, there are so many bedas in the judiciary, in Congress, in the House, and the Senate, Mga clerk of court, makikita mo sa mga huwes, etc., etc. 
So very encouraging. That's why ito mga bats natin na mga law students and very hopeful, no? Speaking of bright tomorrow, Edward Dean and Vice Dean, they are the bright tomorrows. Kayo po yun. Tama. Thank you so much po, Attorney Gialogo and Commissioner Sarmiento for answering uh, the questions head on po. Yeah, era, uh, era. Yes po, Dean. Yeah, uh, I, I observe uh, there are a number of uh, questions in the chat box. Can you, yes, can you take uh, pictures of this? And uh, I request uh, uh, Attorney Ed to go over and come up with uh, short answers to be posted uh, sa LSG uh, uh, FB page natin. Para, kasi nakita ko may iba pang mga interesting questions. Ha? Yes, so uh, I, I hope Attorney Ed will uh, uh, yes. give uh, oh, some yeah. time. After na, kahit bukas po. Basta i-post na lang natin sa... Ano, sa FB page ng LST. Salamat, salamat. Thank you po, Dean, for that. Okay, so thank you for that uh, informative open forum, Attorney Edward Dialogo and Commissioner Remes Sarmiento. And thank you to all those students who participated and asked questions. We apologize again for the time constraint, but we will note all these questions as advised by Dean Delson. And we will post them as soon as uh, the answers are available. Again, thank you so much, Attorney Dialogo and Commissioner Sarmiento. Thank you so much, Po. Yes, thank you, Dean. And thank for... you, Vice Dean. Thank you, Po. Yes, thank you very much. And for um, the next part of our program, uh, let's honor our guests by recognizing their efforts today. Sorry, is it my turn <laughs> when you said let's honor our guests? <laughs> uh, it's the presentation of the certificate ah, okay. po, Vice Dean. All Sorry right, po. all right. Yes, so we're just having some technical difficulty, but we prepared um, electronic certificates. Yes, for Commissioner Sarmiento. Uh, Andrea? Yes, uh, so for our Certificate of Appreciation, uh, this certificate is awarded to Commissioner Rene V. Sarmiento for sharing his valuable knowledge as a guest speaker in the Law Colloquium, the Dean Emeritus Virgilio B. Hara Lecture Series on the 10th of February of the year 2022, signed by our Vice Dean, Attorney Francesca Lourdes Senga, our Dean, Attorney Marciano G. Delson, and our Administrative Officer, Attorney Lian David M. Juanico. Salamat po. Salamat po. And this Certificate of Appreciation is awarded to Attorney Edward Gialogo for sharing his valuable knowledge as a guest speaker in the Law Colloquium, the Dean Emeritus Virgilio B. Hara Lecture Series on the 10th of February of the year 2022 and signed by our Vice Dean, Attorney Francesca Lourdes M. Senga, our Dean, Attorney Marciano G. Delson, and our Administrative Officer, Attorney Lian David M. Juanico. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you very much. Paul. It's my pleasure to talk with you. Ayan. Again, thank you so much, Paul. And before we proceed with the last part of our program, uh, may we request everyone to please turn on their cameras just for a photo opportunity and, of course, documentation with our guests. Hello, um, start po muna tayo sa first slide. There are 33 windows, so I'll tell na lang po pagtapos na. Thank you.
Okay, so everyone, keep smiling. What page are we at, Nika? Nine. Okay, so... Keep smiling um, Hindi ako magaling sa math, but 20 plus pages to go. <laughs> Let's go, mga ka-page. 12, kaya pa ba? Let's keep our smiles on, everyone. So nice talaga to see people's faces through Zoom. Kahit ganito man lang, we can see each other virtually. Hello, okay na po. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Miss Abbas. Yan. And then, so for now, um, let us have our closing remarks. This will be um from our dear mother of lions, our dear Vice Dean. Francesca Lourdes Senga. Um, first, thank you for calling me that, but I, I, I would like to reserve <laughs> that term to um, Vice Dean Rizel Castillo Talion. So she was and she will always be the mother of lions. So I, 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 I respectfully decline <laughs> to be uh -huh. referred to that and I hope we uh, reserve that name to her. Okay, so pursuant to the nature of a colloquium, we had a successful, informative, and very productive discussion today. We had a conference with a question and answer period on election law. And um, it's all thanks to our um, learned lecturers, Commissioner Rene Sarmiento, Commissioner Antonio Co, and Attorney Edward Gialogo. And more importantly, it's also thanks to our students, to the students of the university. We also want to acknowledge the presence of Dean Emeritus Hara through his daughter, Miss Tina Hara Abatayo, and grandson, Guillen Hara Kalayan. Um, we also want to acknowledge and thank um, the presence and the attendance of our faculty members. Okay. Um, we also want to express our gratitude uh, to the law student government, our student volunteers, the bar operations, the ICTC office, and the staff, and um, all of those who... Um, provided invaluable support and assistance um, from the days leading up to and today. So um, that being said, I hope that we may um, achieve the values and ideals set forth in the preamble of the Constitution as what Commissioner Sarmiento mentioned earlier today. Um, again, we want to thank everyone for attending and good afternoon. Thank you very much, Vice Dean, for those encouraging words. Uh, and we also want to thank you and uh, Dean Delson for your very industrious spirit. Uh, to formally close this program, Ms. Manuel? Yes, so now let us hear our bed on him.
Thank you for spending your afternoon with us. I am Aira Albon. And I am Andrea Manuel. And this has been Law Colloquium. The Dean, the Dean Emeritus, Emeritus Virgilio Bihara Lecture Series. Again, thank you and have a restful semestral break to everyone. Congratulations, you, everyone. Dean. Vice Dean, yes. congratulations po. Oh, maraming salamat, lalo na sa ating mga estudyante. Yeah. Uh, Sir Rene, attorney Opo. Ed, and of course for uh, commissioner ko, uh, ipiprint namin yung ano yung uh, physical ano nung, nung uh, uh, certification. Ay, Tapos okay. ipapadala sa inyo together with our simple token po. Opo, opo. So, maraming salamat. Thank you maraming po, salamat. thank you po, thank you okay. po.